We made this. Welcome to the Starlight Ballroom. Hey. Welcome to Shipwrecked and Comatose, the podcast about Red Dwarf here on the We Made This Podcast Network. And we are on our, I want to say third, no, and we are on our fourth episode of the week <laughs> where we're looking at the Smegazines. <laughs> With me at this time are um, two people who I haven't podcasted with for quite a while. Despite the episode being on yesterday. <laughs> say hello, Colin. Was that Carlin? Was that a hybrid I of said both Carlin. of Ah, uh, okay. Hello. I don't drink. No, it sounded like the. I think the the audio glitched as you said it. So yeah, yeah. it was it was like our benefit. <laughs> yeah. Say hello, Carlin. Hello. <laughs> Say hello, Carl. Hello, Carl. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Um. So yeah, you've been listening to this on a daily basis. And um, the first three episodes were recorded about six months ago. <laughs> so we could have been professional and listened back to them and decided to um, remember what we'd said six months ago. <laughs> but we didn't. So we haven't got a fucking clue. <laughs> I've got a vague idea. <laughs> oh, I mean. well, well, yeah. I know that yesterday was, was the uh, last magazine I ever bought. Yes, I do remember you saying that. No, I don't. That's a lie. (laughs) Did you say that? I think I mentioned it, but I don't remember if I went into why, but I can do that today. (laughs) So basically, we were planning on doing these in between series five and six, but scheduling conflicts and various life things. And yeah, we are going to do all this magazines and we'll be damned if we're not doing all this magazines. But yeah, it, I think a six-month wait between episodes that were supposed to be weekly was particularly weird. But hey, we're back, and it's happening. I think it's fairly telling that it was you going, and we'll be damned if we don't make it through all these, and me and Colin sat here in relative silence. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think we should get through them, yeah. eventually. <laughs> you two signed up to do all of this magazines. There's, what, 18 issues? Something like that. Something, yeah. So we're, we're yeah. more than halfway through. Uh, we will be by the end of this, yeah. We're more than halfway through already. This, if there's about 18, this is episode 11, uh, issue 11. Yeah. Which is more than half True. of 18. It's math. True. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I guessed at 18 it might have been more. I mean, I could have a look at the files on my desktop. Right, I'm going to do that. This is me being super professional. This is going to be a great episode. I'm not going to cut this bollocks either. Uh <laughs> Oh, dear. <laughs> there are 23 magazines. I was totally wrong saying there was 18. So we're not quite halfway, but we will be by the end of this recording scheduled run of weekly shit. Yes. But yeah, kind of, yeah, we are, you know, amateur podcasters. We don't get paid. We do this because we enjoy it and we have fun. And sometimes life gets in the way and that's going to continue to happen. But I still think people enjoy what we do right did no one else get the emails from tony threatening legal action (laughs) Um, well no anyway enough of that chat should we talk about magazine issue 11 i think we should as that's what we're here for Okay, so the front cover is a naked rimmer with two Princess Leia ladies who are about to rub his nipples. And the Inquisitor is asking if you are worthy in the top right-hand corner. And, well, is it me or is that just a bit kind of erotic? Should it be on the top shelf? Well, you've missed out the headline, which is Exposed Rimmer's Sex Life. So, that's true. As an eleven-year-old, <laughs> oh, you know, I was ten. It was a month before my eleventh birthday because this was December ninety-two. As a ten-year-old going into uh, the local post office to buy this, this was the first issue that I was oh. not allowed to buy. So I went into the post office. I'd, I'd got it saved, and uh, 
man behind the counter who was uh, a few years later would have been my boss, my first paper round. <laughs> went, went all Brilliant. went all Mary Whitehouse and was like, "I'm not going to sell you that. You're not old enough for that." Um, and he cancelled. I was the only person in the village that bought it, so he used to, he ordered it specially in for me and just cancelled the order. So uh, this was the the I didn't get to read this one until doing this research. What a bastard! Yeah, <laughs> totally I fair don't though. Know. You were ten. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it does seem like a poor choice to put this on the front cover when they know kids are reading it. Yeah. And you can't have been the only kids that couldn't buy this issue because it had the word sex on the front. Yeah, exactly. I think as well this has gone into what we've talked about in previous one. How they sort of they, they still don't know their identity yet and even yeah. though we're a long way into the run now. Mm. And I think this is them, because uh, uh, they're published by, it's Fleetway, isn't it, who published yeah. 2000 AD, and they mm-hmm. sort of flip between like, are we for the kids, are we more adult like 2000 AD, Way, yeah. you know, and it, they just don't know. And uh, Yeah, I mean, they, they did, uh, Fleetway did the Thunderbirds comic as well, and, and Sonic mm-hmm. the comic at a similar sort of time, and I was, I was reading both of those, um, and they didn't have, you know, exposed scott tracy's love life on the front mm. uh, <laughs> brains what's he like off duty <laughs> yeah so it does seem like a very poor choice and obviously we'll never know but i genuinely think their readership numbers would have gone down because of the front cover well it did by at least one <laughs> <laughs> Good point, well made. The, I mean, a thing I've noticed slightly off, but it's on the cover as well, is that picture of the Inquisitor, all I'm thinking is that would make a great sew-on patch. It really would, yeah. 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 On, on, a, on a bomber jacket. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like Lister's bomber jacket, that would make yeah. a really good sew-on patch. <laughs> so so that, would that be a bit like Lister collecting like teeth from things he's killed <laughs> if he put like... If you put like a, a patch of everyone he defeated in battle on his bomber jacket. Well, well, well Mark, that's that's a bit darker than I was thinking. But... <laughs> anyway, teeth are rubbish. Collect ears. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, how did we get to this? It, point? Ears are much easier to thread onto a necklace. True, they look oh, cool. Dear. <laughs> So the contents page, it mentions a lot of Red Dwarf goodies for Christmas. And we've discussed this briefly before. I can't remember when or where. But I don't remember there being very much Red Dwarf merch. But this seems to suggest that there was. Did either of you have Red Dwarf merch? T-shirts and books. That was about the extent of it. I remember there being a a, a set sort of six to eight T-shirts. And then I don't remember any others ever really appearing. We've seen all of them advertised in this magazine, haven't we? Yeah, so mm. I remember that um, in the same way that you weren't allowed to buy this magazine, uh, my mother saw the one that said, there was one of Lister holding a bazooka that said, let's get out there and twat it. <laughs> and uh, I think once I saw that, I was like, yeah, you're not having a, a Red Dwarf t-shirt. Yeah, I wasn't allowed that particular t-shirt, but I was allowed the Gunman of the Apocalypse one. Yeah, I had the uh, Ace Rimmer one, which uh, had all the tour dates on the back, which was awesome. I need to get on Redbubble and start looking at some of these ones that people have made. Like, there's, I, I, I was, I, I, you might have one, Mark. There's somebody's done the London Jets t shirt. Yeah, load, loads of boot, bootleg versions of the London yeah. Jets one, and they give, uh, give Keisha a chance, which uh, Kurt has got. Yes. I don't know how I feel about bootleg stuff. I mean, are Dave releasing official merch that no. will actually go to no. the people who make the program? I am okay with it. As long as it's not a T-shirt that is readily available officially, mm. so True. if you know if if somebody's made a quite cool creative um, fan design, I'm perfectly happy with having that on a T-shirt. Yeah, and I I agree. If it's if it's been made by the fans out of genuine love, and it's not just like you know like the things you get on Wish dot com, which is just you know. 
the logo or something yeah. like that on there, then I think it's good because it, it's it's keeping the fan base going as well. And I'm, yeah. I'm saying this as someone that's actually considering launching a range of T-shirts on Redbubble, and a couple of them are Red Dwarf designs. Cool. Well, there we go. One of them is primarily for Mark. Um, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Which is uh, is it about fucking clones of himself? It's not, <laughs> but what what's on it is two big words on the front, which is juicy giant, and then a picture of a peach <laughs> and a picture of a metal straw. <laughs> I would buy that. I reckon that's actually good enough for some people to pick up. So juicy giant peach. So I'm I'm gonna have a go for that one. I'm gonna I'm gonna start making some t shirts. <laughs> Amazing. So, so since we recorded that, <laughs> I have discussed with my partner the line you want to squeeze my buttons <laughs> together to make a juicy giant peach. And I asked him, may I squeeze your buttons together to make a juicy giant peach? And he said no. Really? <laughs> and so so I I have not squeezed his buttocks together to make a juicy giant um, peach. And as the, I um, intend to keep him forever, it appears that I shall never be able <laughs> to squeeze anyone's buttocks together to make a juicy giant peach. I'm, I'm a bit surprised by that. I, I've met your partner. He's a lovely chap. I thought he'd at least... Look, I'll tell you what, Mark. Next time we all get together, you can squeeze my buttocks together. <laughs> 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 we'll film it and put it out on the Twitter. <laughs> We're going to make some dreams come true here. <laughs> this has already gone way off the fucking rails. I, in my in my head, I'm envisioning that the first three episodes of this run were really professional and we were grown up. Yeah, they were. It was us. These... Yeah. <laughs> so, so the content page. <laughs> yeah, the content. <laughs> as as we got. Um, yeah, the content page also has androids on it, doesn't it? And um, it does. I still don't find it funny. It's done its one gag. It it has. Oh. Although I noticed yesterday. There's uh, some Morse code up the side. And uh, I've been reading... Do you remember those old uh, Usborne puzzle adventure books from the 80s? Yes. Uh, yes. I've been collecting them and reading them with my daughter recently. Amazing. Uh, and they're brilliant. But it means that every time I see a code, I have to solve it. So... Uh, okay. It's, I mean, it's only Morse code, so it's nice and easy. All it is, is it tells you, uh, by Kev F. Oh. Because it's uh, Kev F. Oh. Kev F. Sutherland, who uh, has also worked for the Dandy and Beano, and also Marvel, all of which were better than what he's done with the Androids cartoon. I actually <laughs> like the art style of the Androids cartoon. I think it's I think it's quite interesting. The, I, yeah, the art style is fine. It's just the yeah. storyboards are fucking terrible. Yeah, <laughs> it's maybe a, if he's still working for the Dandy at the same time, maybe that's why he's had to put his name into. Morse that, code. That is a fair point. I didn't mm. think of that. It's uh, it's not quite for the same target audience, is it? No. no. What I do like about it is it's very Red Dwarf in jokey in a similar way in the backwards episode, you know. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the Sado that yeah, yeah. rewound the tape and played it back. So it's it's very on brand. Yeah. So that's 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 increased my appreciation of the Androids comic a little bit, I think. Cool. But not by much. <laughs> Next up is news from the dwarf and headlines being Hattie's gone. Series six has a tight deadline. They're doing the ten percenters. The stuff about Maid Marion and Cyberzone, and there's also some fascinating stuff about how there's supposed to be a film that never happened. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, an, an American film studio is putting an offer to make a Red Dwarf film. Uh, the writers have been keen for some time to make a film, and with the sorry state of the British film industry, which it's thankfully a lot better now, this American deal could provide the cash to do it. When asked how things were going with the film project, Rob Grant told this magazine, we haven't heard anything for two or three weeks, so details are indeed sketchy. That's a bit of the mm. good thing, though. Like, two weeks is going, ah, oh, it's dead. Two weeks! Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's films that have been in... 
you know, we're talking about something like they even mention in this the talk about a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in the Doctor Who film, which never yeah. get made. Like, well, think, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy does, but for well over a decade after this. Yeah. Well, Doctor Who, the the McGann film, which is referred to as Doctor Who the movie, that gets made not long after this. Yeah. Grossly underrated, in my opinion. I actually really quite like the McGann film. And even if you don't like the McGann film, the big finish stuff Mm. completely redeems Paul McGann's Doctor anyway. Well, as as we're just coming into this, I, uh, where I work, just hosted Big Finish Day. Right. Um, Amazing. With panels and and everything. And the guest this year was, well, it's the first one in like two, three years due to what's been going on in the world. What's been um, going on in the world? Um, you know, just scheduling and life. Oh, okay, cool, cool. But the main guest was Paul McGann. Cool. Amazing. Um, talking, and he was there to talk about Big Finish and everything else. And and uh, yeah, he, he, from what I gather, because I was working for a bit of it, it, he loves it. He's, you know, he's so happy to be part of Doctor Who. Anyway, when most people, I can imagine quite a few actors, if they did that one film, it didn't really go anywhere. Wouldn't come back like, what, 20 odd years later to shoot a five minute short to yeah. up a continuity error? <laughs> <You know? laughs> That five minutes short's underrated as well. Yeah. And Paul McGann's great in it. Why are we talking about Doctor Who? The next section is Red Dwarf 4 on video. So it's a review of that written by Steve Lyons. And I'm pretty sure we've discussed this before. Steve Lyons is also related to Doctor Who. I've read Doctor Who fiction yeah. written by Steve Lyons. Well, it's, Steve's the he's basically the, rain, the main article writer for this magazine. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, they point out that they switched from Red Dwarf 1 and they bitch about it. And it's interesting that that's my memory as well, that I didn't watch the first two series until well after I'd watched 3, 4 and 5. Yeah. So, yeah, Yeah. that's really interesting that my memory is right. Because a lot of the time our memories have actually been proved wrong on this podcast, haven't they? <laughs> no, se- series one was definitely, I, th- I think it was the following Christmas that I got it. And that was after series six had aired. Mm. So yeah, I think it was, I saw series one after series six, I think. It's definitely after series five, obviously, because this is them talking about it there when it's after series yeah, five. Yeah. It basically summarizes Red Door 4. And, um, tells you what we are well what at the time was quite interesting but we've covered heavily on the podcast already that um they rearranged the order due to meltdown being anti-war yes but i think that's something you've got to take into account when you're reading these magazines is that a lot of the information that is very kind of mundane and almost over egged for us yeah was really really quite revealing at the time yeah Mm. I must admit, with pages like this, when we've been recapping it, a, a song plays in my head a bit, which was, Steve, we need to fill a page. <laughs> <laughs> right, any old bollocks. And um, he's not like he's writing like rubbish, but it, it, it's just filler to me. <laughs> it... I think there's less relevant bits of filler than about the, you know, a, a sort of review of the, the new videos that have come out. Yeah. I think that's that's relevant to the fan base because they're going to be buying them. But it is, at the same time, most of us already know pretty much everything that it, it says in there because 4, 5, and 6 will have already seen. Yeah. It just reminds me how annoyed I am thinking about it that when the the Series 1 and 2 videos came out, they had that gorgeous painted artwork, and then these ones have got, like, word art. Yeah. I just yeah, because yeah. I always forget that they came out after, and they came out with this really gorgeous artwork, and like, oh, we could have done that for all of them. <laughs> yeah, true. So next up is a comic strip called Wetware, and it's really, really awesome Holly stuff in the same issue that they announced that Hattie Hayridge is leaving. Yeah. And I found that really kind of sad. Yeah, it's a it's a nice little sort of philosophical... Is that how you pronounce it? Philosophical? 
Philosophical. 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 That. Yeah. Uh, comic. So, yeah, you, you basically got Lister teaching an AI system how to live uh, before Cat destroys it by pissing all over it. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. This is so red. Yeah, the, the, but the, there's a few nice sort of um, bits of, of holly in this issue. There's, an, there's another really sad bit that we'll come to later on mm. um, that I noticed. It, it could have been an episode. Yes. It could very easily have been an episode. They've already done stuff with green screen, and for the, the bits where it's inside the AI, if they could very easily have made it look like how it does look here. And uh, I can imagine it wouldn't have been that expensive to do, and it would have given Hattie Hayridge a, you know, a, a starring episode for once, which she never really did have. I no. do think she was absolutely wasted mm. with with what she could have been, because uh, I, I I still prefer the Hattie Hayridge version of Holly uh, to the Norman version. Yeah, and she's never been in the Dave ones, has she? No, I don't think so. No, I'd Sound I'd like to see them work work it somehow that they get her back because she still looks pretty much the same. Yeah. So it's it's strange that they can't even figure out like meet another computer or you know Holly has a glitch and he turns into to into happy for a show. But yeah, you, yeah, I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but it does seem from the next issue, that it was actually a bit more from her side, that she wasn't yeah. coming back. I think it was, you've not given me enough to do, fuck it, I'm going to go, kind of thing. Mm, um, maybe. But that's tomorrow. <laughs> Indeed. And the artwork is fantastic. Yeah. I really, really, I mean, in particular, I really like the pages that had no panels. And I love it when comic strips and art and stuff is experimental and does something different and something unique that you could only do in comic books. Yeah. So I really love the pages with no panels because how would you represent that in telly? And I've always said since we've started looking at this magazines that I like it when it does stuff you couldn't do on the telly show. Yeah. So, yeah. Lovely work. Alan Burrows is the artist who's uh, he's again worked on Beano and another 2000 AD one. There's a lot of 2000 AD crossover, obviously, in this. But he also uh, wrote for uh, Commando and Eagle, <laughs> which I very occasionally used to get the little uh, mini comic versions of those. And uh, it's all very uh, shooty for uh, somebody who is now a uh, anti war pacifist. <laughs> True. True. Yeah. I also like the idea that if, given their druthers, Holly and Lister would probably shag. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, good. Next up is the Paul Jackson interview. And the man that I saw at the Hollyhop convention and the lockdown stuff, who was charming and likeable and clearly a fan of the show and enthusiastic about his time on the show, does not seem to be the man that's interviewed here. <laughs> it's, I didn't think he came across as unlikable. It's just it was all stuff that I already know. But at the time, it might not have been stuff that I already knew. I don't know. It just seemed like he got a massive ego from the responses to me. Some of the egos justified. Yeah. You know, it, it would Red Dwarf wouldn't have existed without him bringing it to TV. I mean, in, in all the interviews I've ever seen with him, the main thing that comes across is, is this is a man that will tell you if he doesn't like you. <laughs> you know, yes. This, this is a, this is a blunt man. Yeah. And yes. sort of young and angry and well, he's probably older there, but like an angry, and in this, he does seem to be very blunt and stuff where it's just like, we can't keep up with you know terminator we're not on the same level as this but i think sometimes you need that because i mean it, having met writers and done writing yourself you're like and then Kryshen will fly on a silver surfboard through the cosmos and then <laughs> somebody stood there going we can't really afford that you know and i think that's what paul jackson was and rimmer will skydive on the back of an alligator exactly yeah <laughs> 
And I think preposterous. <laughs> I've met people who have had that attitude before who've worked in in media of like no no frills, we're on the job. You know, a bit, this bit of realism. Yeah. <laughs> and you do kind of need that, isn't there? There's some people it's like you get the cop show, it's like, well that cop's a, a dick, but in, then you find out, you know, they donate half their wages to kids' charities that just don't tell anyone about it. And I think Paul Jackson's a bit like that, and he's like, "What a bastard!" But it's like, but that bastard got the young ones and Red Dwarf and yeah. this and that and the other on the air, and it's... kept it on the air. So Craig Charles and Danny John Jules didn't just piss it away in the hacienda. <laughs> <laughs> if I had to deal with all that, I'd do an interview like, "Yeah, no, it wouldn't have existed without me." I guess there's some truth there. And it's a lot fucking better than the next article. <laughs> yes, Judgment Day covers readers' responses to a competition where you justify the existence of fictional characters to the Inquisitor. And the characters were Dwayne Dibley, Wilma Flintstone, Judge Dredd, Christine Kachansky, Vera Duckworth and Norman Wisdom. And... It's shit. <laughs> Steve, yeah. we've got to fill some space. It's it, yeah. it's basically, and you do get this a fair bit in this magazine, more proof that the readers should stick to reading because mm. it's yes. really fucking amateurish bollocks and it does it, yeah. it's not worth two pages of this magazine. Not one of the answers felt witty or funny to me no. and there was some really unpleasant toxicity as well. Yeah. I don't think we really need to go any further on that, but... I'm going to bitch about the artwork as well. It looked like caricatures that have been done on Blackpool Pleasure Beach. Mm. It's bad. It, they're, they're really shit caricatures. Mm. One's, yeah, one's done on Blackpool Pleasure Beach that, you know, people would not pay for. <laughs> yeah. The one of Wilma Flintstone looks like somebody's incredibly bad tattoo. <laughs> and that yes. And that's the best of the bunch. Yeah. Actually, the Norman Wisdom one isn't too bad. but I uh, thought Vera Duckworth was Barbara Windsor. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a triple. <laughs> I thought Kachansky's looked very Bride of Frankenstein-y. Apart yeah. From the hair is actually her head. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're all... Cack. We'd all spare Wilma, though, right? Because she gets spared yeah. in the article. I, I agree with that bit. Oh, yeah. But that, surely that goes without saying. Well, of course. Yeah. I'd spare all of them that I know anything about. The only thing I know about Vera Duckworth was she was on Coronation Street, which I've never watched, so don't care. <laughs> no. Podcast. <laughs> Colin no. does Cory. No. From the beginning. <laughs> wow. I don't have time for this one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, yeah. We've had six months between yeah. the fucking episodes. Next up is Rimmer's Angels, and it's the article on the front cover about Rimmer and his love life and romance. And what it does is it reams off all the icky stuff that Rimmer has done. It's just a list, basically, and then just going through all of them, you know, in order, every woman that he has encountered at any point or even mentioned. <laughs> and it, I, yeah. I think this might be a, uh, Steve, we need some filler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it ended up on the front cover and stopped you getting to read it's it. It's the fucking cover story. This, this is, uh, it's not one of the better issues that I've read. It's got to be said. No. Credit where credit's due. There is a good paragraph about how Rimmer is entitled and that it's repulsive. Yeah. Credit where credit's due. Yeah. yeah. My main thought was four pages. And then my other, th- I kind of drifted away while I was reading it because, like you say, it's not the greatest one. And all I could think of is there'd be a great scene somewhere where they're all sitting in like a therapy group. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Rimmer's lovers. <laughs> so, what did you do? Oh, I ripped his thing off before I sacrificed him to the unspeakable one. <laughs> Oh, how about you? Oh, I got hit on the head with a winch. You know, it's... it's not... <laughs> Did he shout Geronimo with you? You know, it's... <laughs> and then you'd have Nirvana, Nirvana Crane sitting there not wondering what the rest of them are complaining about because she seemed to quite like him. Yeah. 
Small portions, but so many courses. Indeed. That used to be a grinder account, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so much confidence <laughs> <laughs> next up is infinity welcomes careful reader and it's a read any good books lately special and we all know about my ridiculous enjoyment of read any good books for both the pun and <laughs> for the fact that it's a book review thing yeah um and it just sits there and sings the praises of of the books really it is a very good job that mm. the majority of Smagazine readers will have already read all of the books that, well, at least um, Infinity Welcomes Careful Drivers and Better Than Life, because it's not spoiler-free no. in any way. No. <laughs> it very explicitly details the ending of the first book, which is a twist <laughs> for people that haven't read it. If you haven't read it, read it. It's a fucking brilliant book. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we, we're going to cover it at some point, aren't we? Definitely. At some point, yeah. Mm. But, you know... Gap of the Trifibian Monster had to come first. <laughs> didn't have to come first. I just wanted to chat with Rob because I hadn't chatted with him for ages. Fair. <laughs> um, but the one thing that I did notice was that it um, heavily criticises the Red Dwarf Companions for its simplistic episode summaries and profiles. Wait a minute. The fucking Smegazine did exactly that. Yep. Hypocritical much? <laughs> I had that. This is the weird thing. Looking at this, I had all three of these books on this first part, and I had them for donkey's years. I've still got the audio books of Infinity and Better Than Life now because, yeah. because of the podcast. I went and found them again, and they still hold up. Yeah. Mm. They really do. And the companion at the time, as a younger fan, I could I could read that from cover to cover multiple times and not be bored. I you I didn't have the Red Dwarf Companion, but I used to read loads of those. I definitely had all the uh, uh the first two Buffy Watchers guides I definitely used to read loads and the yeah. uh there was an X Files one that I used to read loads as well. Back, it's not as much a thing anymore, but back in the day you could not be a good tie in book. Yeah. Well, these days it's all that kind, the, particularly the episode guide kind of thing, is all podcasts and uh, stuff on the internet, isn't it? Never take off. It would, never will, absolutely. No. no. The other thing in this article was, I really want to read The Reconstructed Heart now. It really does seem like a fascinating book. I think I found it. Give me two seconds, because I'm pretty sure on my mission to find as much to feed your specials habit. <laughs> I did find it at some point. Give me a second. You are as obsessed as I am about these bloody specials. You just hide it better. You can get it for less than three quid on eBay. Well, I'm sure I'll Brilliant. find the audiobook. That's the thing. Because he did it as a lecture. Yeah. I think he did. I think there was a, a, a film version of it. I'm sure it was on Channel 4. Yeah. Let's have a look. I know I found it somewhere. I know he did do it for... It's like a, one of them very early Channel 4 things. Yes, there it is. Reconstructed Heart, an illustrated lecture by Robert Llewellyn. 40 minutes back in 1992. Yeah. I smell special. <laughs> do you? <laughs> I do, actually. I've just got back from Benidorm and I bought some very, very nice... Aftershave that you can only get in duty free currently. It's not been released. Wow. So I do actually. That's exciting. Yeah. I know. I didn't buy any booze <laughs> when I went to Benidorm. So I spent it on, well, technically it's alcohol, I suppose. <laughs> Don't <it>. drink it. <laughs> I'm not going to drink it. It smells too nice. Okay. Anyway, next up is Hollygrams and uh, Kate George's lust for Chris Barry. If, if you're listening to this, Kate George, Naughty. <laughs> the the main thing that I thought of in this one is uh, you got Michael Wilcox from Kids Grove really complaining about Nigel Kitching's artwork in the uh, a couple of issues ago, which uh, fuck off! It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, that did seem odd to me. Yeah, Nigel Kitching's artwork is utterly fantastic and better than most of the, definitely better than all of the other covers that we've had. Yeah. Yeah. We've we've had some proper understated, like 
artwork. There's more than, you know, they've gone more than I think people were probably expecting them to go for the Red Dwarfs magazine. Yeah. Mm. It's. I'd love there to be a collection of the comic strips. Maybe some fan may put one together at some point. Yeah. If Rob Grant was been talking, and we've said this before, talking about, you know, he wants to bring out more merch and expand the universe and that. Something that would be great would be, can you do a collection of the comic strips? Because I can't imagine it's going to be super expensive to gather them together. But it might just be, you know, do the originals still exist? Because these are blatantly... I mean, they're all owned by Fleetway, I would imagine. So mm-hmm. then that means the rights are all going to pretty much be in the same place, I would guess, mm-hmm. unless the rights return to the writers and artists after a certain amount of time. I have no clue. I am not a lawyer. Mm. <laughs> no, me neither. But you're right. It would be fun. Shall we move on to the um, next? <laughs> the, the Inquisitor comic strip. Yeah, the next comic strip, which is actually does have Nigel Kitching as the artist. Yes. And is is it me, or is this the Inquisitor's face turn? <laughs> <laughs> Possible. Spoilers for a 30-year-old comic i don't know why but i still find comics about the death of robert maxwell fucking hilarious <laughs> for a 30 year old news story yeah the inquisitor murders robert maxwell for being a cunt and a fair play that, as far as i'm concerned is a face turn for the inquisitor probably should have got his daughter as well because <laughs> initially when i first read it i was like oh God, it felt like a bit of a cheap joke, but uh, yeah, it is. It is funny, and because I, I hadn't thought about Robert Maxwell in years, <laughs> well, initially, he looks familiar, and then when he gets when the splash thing is like, oh, it's Robert Maxwell. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, good, what a twat! Again, I think we need to talk about who the audience is. Ten-year-old Colin surely didn't understand the nuances of the Robert Maxwell problem, right? I didn't understand the nuances of it, but I did know that Robert Maxwell was an absolute prick and had fallen off his boat and died. And I thought that was funny. Oh, Oh, right. I had a... There was around the same sort of time, there was... It was an X-Files cash-in type thing where there was a little one-panel comic cartoon things like you know like the far side and that kind of thing there was a one of uh, a little book that i had that was uh, aliens just little alien cartoons and the only one i remember from it was them absolutely accidentally crashing into robert maxwell on his boat and knocking him into the water Mm. and i remember thinking that was hilarious at the time and it's the only bit i remember from it you know 30 years later so uh robert maxwell's death is funny (laughs) Just for some reason, when a 10 year old Colin, I just imagine like a small Colin still with the beard. Just me too. <laughs> oh. I mean, to be fair, small Colin with the beard, that's 40 year old Colin. <laughs> <laughs> Tiny shorts and sort of his school blazer. Morning, Posty. I want my copy of the Smegazine, please. Hold on, hold on. I'm wearing shorts now. Yeah. I'm quite short. I've got a beard. I'm reading this magazine. What is the difference? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear <laughs> I have to go to work that's the fucking difference <laughs> next up is the Red Dwarf Series 5 Grant and Naylor look back which is an actually quite interesting writer retrospective Yes, and um, they discuss Juliet May which we've discussed quite significantly in our Series 5 coverage yeah I, I thought they were really they were very honest about that but they were really gracious mm. and, uh, yes yes quite respectful about the mm. you know she basically fucking left him in the lurch mm. um after getting in completely over her head for all of this they turned around when it looks like the best series yeah uh, when we've been talking about like it does look phenomenally good <laughs> it's yeah. like yeah especially stuff like terraform looks great so for a, i mean she was a fairly inexperienced director at the time yeah so, if anything, it kind of just shows like she's going to go on to do something really good when she's got like experience under her belt, and she did. Yeah, it does seem remarkably perceptive to be gracious about it. Yeah, one thing I did find really interesting in this article that I didn't know was that they explicitly said that quarantine was created as a cheap episode, but as a budgetary thing, and. I'd never even thought about it before, but you can see how that would be cheap. It's all in one room, really. It's a bottle episode. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, 
Uh, yeah, which is specifically designed to reduce the budget for a series that needs to save a bit of money. And mm. bottle episodes can be brilliant. That is that is one of them that's really fucking good. I mean, they've, they've admitted it, that they've done it in later series as well. Um, is it Duck Soup? It's yeah. a bottle episode. It's still a bottle episode that they did in the car park because, like, we need to save money. Yeah. Doctor Who, in mm. the early few... I know we're going back to Doctor Who, but in the early couple of series that they did, there's blatant bottle episodes where they're barely... like Because they're setting up for, like, a big finale... There's the the infamous Peter K episode. Yeah, yeah. They're for about two minutes. The absorber love. But coming from that, there's there's things like Blink, which uh, Moff Moffat did, which again is kind of a bottle episode because they're barely in it, and it's all Carey Mulligan. Yeah, because they come off to go do something for like the finale or something. So it's. They can work really well. I've seen cartoons take the mick out of the prospect of like, oh, he's in a coma and yeah. cut back to clips from years gone by. <laughs> bye, 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 yeah, that that's a bad way to do yeah. a uh, saving money. But a bottle episode is, you know, done done well can be absolutely brilliant. Yeah. The, the sad bit that I, I mentioned earlier in this bit is obviously this interview yeah. was done before the news had come out because they quite specifically say they want to give Holly more to do in series six. Mm. And then, yep, she's she's not, which is what leads me to think it was more her leaving than uh, her being written out. Kind of heartbreaking, though. It is. Maybe wonder though with that. Oh, we want to give Holly more to do, and then about a week later, they could have been. What can we actually do though? <laughs> <laughs> but apart from like put her in a in a body that gives like Hattie Ridge to walk around. But even then, you've it's basically having two Crichtons, isn't it? Yeah, it's... yeah exactly. Th- this is the problem. They um, most of her or most of Holly's purpose was for exposition, and when Crichton was there, he was a more mobile version of that. Mm. Um, the only thing I could think of is they turned her insane, and she's the one who stole Red Dwarf and drove off into. <laughs> and she becomes have... becomes the baddie like Willow in that later series of Buffy. Yeah. <laughs> Series six. Anyway, we're not talking about Buffy. We're not talking about Doctor Who. We're talking about this magazines. The next up is the only advert of the entire issue, which is fucking weird because you have some issues that have loads. And this has got a half page ad telling us very importantly that there is a free badge with issue 55 of Superman magazine. To me, that I don't know whether it's because I'm cynical but just that thing of this badge is free. The issue's tap, but this badge is free. <laughs> it's a nice badge. <laughs> yeah. I'd wear that. Next up is the oh so boring profile section filler bollocks. Yeah, and this one is on Holly. The only thing I've got to say about this, other than same old tat, is that it's quite odd with the he she thing, but I don't feel it's insensitive. No, I, I think it mm. handles it well. Mm. It, it's probably one of the only comedy shows that ever put forward a sex change in that mm. show, isn't it? It must have been. And rarely even commented on it. Yeah. It was not yeah. even a, you know, a lesser, uh, particularly a lesser late 80s, 90s series would have made some fucking horrific jokes that really would not have uh, held up well now. Oh yeah, you know we we, yeah. we would have lots of eighties uh, ick to complain about, and then have all the dickheads that don't look as being woke complaining about us complaining about. <laughs> yeah, I think it is worth acknowledging quite strongly that I do feel like the whole Holly thing with them changing their sex was really well done across the board. It's never the butt of a joke, really. Yeah, and. That's remarkable, really, considering, like you say, in the 90s, it would have been horrific on any other telly show. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, Friends was later on, and that had loads of fucking horrible transphobia and stuff in it, looking back on it. The fascinating thing about Friends is at the time it was celebrated for any form of representation and having gay and trans people as like characters on it that had some level of depth. Yeah. And 
I don't know how I feel about friends. I think at the time, if I was a little bit older, that would have been incredibly important to me to have any form of representation on the screen. Yeah. Watching it now, it does kind of jab me in the ribs a bit. But I'm not sure it's quite as bad with friends as people yeah. think if you contextualize it. Whereas some of the stuff we've seen on Red Dwarf, I have found unforgivable. So yeah. maybe I need to take a step back sometimes and be less woke. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Don't tell him that. Twitter just punched the air. <laughs> <laughs> I don't worry, I'm not going to. Good. I, I, I call dog shit when I see dog shit. <laughs> I saw a clip the other day, I don't believe it was on Instagram, of um, it was on like a David Tennant fan thing. I never realised that he played a transsexual in Rabsy Nesbitt. No, I also I didn't, didn't realise this. Yeah, he plays um, the barmaid of the local pub. And it's not... I, I, did, I only saw a clip, but it doesn't appear like they were doing it for laughs. They were actually yeah. like fancy her. And when it revealed like it's David Tennant, they still fancied her. Cool. And admittedly, seeing it, and like, I'd shag them. You know... <laughs> David, David Tennant, dressed as a woman, is gorgeous. <laughs> dressed as a man, is also gorgeous. I was going to say, mm. he's got he's got quite an advantage that he's starting with there, hasn't he? Hasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he plays a remarkably good woman. <laughs> it's uh, But yeah, it's, I, cause I, when I was saying, it just made me think of so, saying, like, Red Dwarf's one of the only ones who ever did any kind of sexual... Uh, identity thing, but then that made me think of Rabsy Nesbitt of all shows did it as well. (laughs) (laughs) Which you really wouldn't expect. No. Next up is a short Jake Bullet thing, the part two of the case of the cashed in contestant. And um, I really quite like this. Mm. It's punchy and also manages to be funny as well. And The Starsky and Hutch uh, gag on the, the second panel Mm. Right, uh, he does the Starsky and Hutch thing, and then he remembered that his car was a convertible. Uh, <laughs> that amused me a lot. And the the, the yeah. artwork is utterly brilliant. Yeah, it's fantastic artwork. Part of me wishes that the strips were slightly longer. Yeah, but it does make me want to read the next bit. I don't know. I think I like the fact that they're short and punchy, and a bit like a newspaper kind of thing. Yeah, rather than a longer because. We get a cliffhanger, and it does feel like this could go on a while. And this does smack to me as being very 2000 AD. Yes. So if they're having all these comic strips that are continuous through the magazines, they should never finish them all on the same month, because that means that gives you an opportunity to go, that's where I'm stopping reading. Yeah. And that's actually really clever, because I now definitely want to read more Jake Bullet. And the only way to do that is to continuously buy the magazine. We'd probably better do another episode for tomorrow then. Yeah. I know, right? I, I like the fact in this Jake Bullet one, they clarify which department he works for. He's homicide, but he's on secondment. Yes. From traffic, which I thought was quite good. It's not that I'm a delusional detective who's actually a traffic warden. I am homicide, but I'm on secondment. And also, the plot of this is about drugs. So with this in the front cover, it's sex and drugs. So your uh, your post office was right, Colin. Yeah, just needs more rock and roll. Yeah. Well, talking about rock and roll, the pin up on the back is a leather-clad smouldering lister. <laughs> True. This is your, what your pin up should be. We've had, like, lister with his space mumps in the past, <laughs> which was an odd choice. Which I, I think I actually had on my wall, though, <laughs> rather than this one, because I didn't get it yet. <laughs> Well, he's looking damn good in this one. <laughs> Pouty. So, yeah, that's what you should be doing with your pin-up. He makes this work. When, as a kid, I bought a deer stalker, a leather deer stalker. <laughs> and I, even with hindsight, I, this isn't me doing it for, I looked like an absolute twat in that deer stalker. <laughs> Certain type of guy to make that work, and Craig Charles is one of those men. It also gives you a closer look on the the badges that he's got on his jacket, which you can't normally see because uh, he's normally moving and, and stuff like that. There's there's two Rolling Stones logos on there. 
There's mm. a, a patch and a badge right next to each other. They're probably still touring in the continuity of Red Dwarf. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a Yin Yang. There's a, a, one of the Apollo mission patches. There's a Sheriff's badge. And there's a Prefect badge, which amused me quite a lot. It's just occurred to me, when they did all these things a couple of years ago of uh, deceased artists but playing as holograms, it's Red Dwarf technologies melding into real life. Yes, I remember seeing uh, a poster for Roy Orbison live on tour. Um, yeah. Thinking, no, he isn't. Yeah. <laughs> Roy Orbison, dead on tour. Yeah. Oh, it all smacks of cheap cash into me, that kind of dog shit. Yeah. The only time I've ever seen it work and look good was Gorillas did it. And it wasn't really... But they're alive. <laughs> no, but as the animated characters. Yes. It was animated. Oh. So well. It was like, it must have been the clearest HD screens you've ever seen in your life, and it looked so good and so real. Yes, I've seen Gorillas live a couple of times, and their, yeah. their visuals are amazing. Yeah. Huh, fair enough. And there's the rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> so that is the end of the issue, and what would you say was your highlight of the issue, Colin? Uh, wet wear. I thought was the best the uh, the comic strip. I really enjoyed that. I thought the artwork was fantastic. I liked the story, and yeah, I just thought it was a, a really good comic. And like we keep saying, I want a graphic novel with a co- you know a collection of all of them. Mm. How about you, Carl? I I enjoyed the strips. I really enjoyed the Jake Paul one, but I really did quite enjoy the Paul Jackson interview. Just because he's always been an interesting figure. He used to, ho- I know at some point he hosted a talk show on Radio 4. Really? I'm, I can't find it. I can usually find a lot of radio. Tat. Tat, yeah. Um, but I can't find that one. It seems to be the only one that's really eluded me over the years. But apparently it's it's really, really good. I've I've got a lot of time for Paul Jackson. He's a fascinating person. Fair enough. Mm. For me, it was wet wear as well. So, um, like like you've said, the comic strips have been the absolute highlight of this magazine. Yeah. Um, for me, consistently across the board as well. And how about your ugh moment of the? Uh, what was the worst thing for you, Colin? Judgment Day, the readers submissiony competitiony thingy. It was fucking shit. <laughs> True. <laughs> Carl. Same. Yeah, that's the thing with this magazine. If they get a bad idea, they're not afraid to stretch it past one page. Well, the the, the problem they've got is they'd already promised that they'd print them in a later magazine, mm. and then all this mm. cat came in, and they were like, "Fucking hell, we've got to put it in." But they probably could have just put it really small print and just put excerpt from it on yeah. the, you know, back cover somewhere. <laughs> yeah. It was pretty wretched, I agree. Put it just one in the in the space where the Superman badge advert was and just <laughs> full page for the Superman badge advert. Yeah, that works. Yeah. I also particularly disliked the Holly profile. I thought that was wretched as well. I thought you were going to say you really liked the Superman badge advert. <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, it's a nice badge. Great badge. Colin, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can find uh, my other podcasts, We Dig Music and Free With This Month's Issue, by searching for them. Uh, but they're also on WeDigPodcast.com and all good podcast apps. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter under uh, Mogwai Fear Satan. Carl, what about you? Uh, you can find me at AllMyLinks.com, Mr. Carl. I'm not up to a great deal at the moment, although I am... Fairly consistently de- designing podcast artwork for the growing Mark Adams podcast network. <laughs> fuck's sake. If anybody out there is looking for some podcast artwork, get in touch. <laughs> as long as it's being hosted by Mark Adams. <laughs> no more podcasts. And we've had this conversation. Kurt's got more fucking podcasts than me. <laughs> anyway, if you want to check out my many, many podcasts... <laughs> Uh, currently active are Right in the Childhood, which is about kids' telly, Chucky Vision, which is about the Child's Play and Chucky franchise, and Geek Polymath, which is a 
interview show where I talk to someone who is a massive fan of something that I quite like. <laughs> they can all be found, like Colin says, by searching whatever you're currently listening to Shipwrecked and Comatose on. You can find them on that podcast provider. If you want me on Twitter, it's at MarkAdamsHC. So, thank you very much for joining us for this episode of Shipwrecked and Comatose. And until next time, <laughs> Neither of us just thought anything to say there, then. Say something witty. I was, I was actually counting how many podcasts you have. <laughs> there you go. Douchebag. That will do. That will do. That's nice. Shipwrecked and Comatose, a Red Dwarf podcast, was created and produced by Mark Adams and Kurt North. You can find us on Twitter at Red Dwarf Pod, and we are part of the We Made This Podcast Network, which can be found online at WeMadeThisPod.com or on Twitter at WeMadeThisPod. Hehehe. <laughs>